Good evening. Welcome to a Saints Guide to Making the Most of Lent. It's a chance to listen to the insights and advice from St Paul to help us prepare for Easter. I'm Matt Mead. I work with the Archdiocese and our speaker tonight is Father Andrew Garden. He is a parish priest at St David's in Dalkeith and he's also the Archdiocesan Vacations Director. This is the first of four talks on St Paul each Monday in Lent for the next four Mondays rather, and it will each last around 30 minutes. Good evening, Father Andrew. Good evening. So welcome to our first uh, session. This evening's session uh, is an introduction. Uh, in the following sessions, we'll be looking at some of St Paul's letters. In this evening's session, um, introduction, St Paul and Lent. Uh, we know that Lent is this beautiful season in the church's year where we prepare for Holy Week, we prepare for Easter. During this season, we're invited, I think, to recenter or refocus our lives to make sure that we're pointing in the right direction, if you like, when we come to the celebration of Holy Week and Easter, kind of renewal of our lives. And St. Paul is an ideal companion, if you like, for Lent, ideal person to encourage us, to help us on our Lenten journey. Already during Lent this year, we've listened to some of the words of St Paul, uh, helping us to start to commit to this season of Lent. On Ash Wednesday, um, as we heard in our first reading that invitation to come back to the Lord with all our hearts. St Paul in the second reading says, be reconciled to God. We beg you not to neglect the grace of God that you have received. Be reconciled to God. On Ash Wednesday, we were invited to listen to these words, to allow that to be the impetus, if you like, for the beginning of this Lenten season. Be reconciled to God. Don't neglect the grace of God that you have received. Inspiring words from St Paul. And then on the first Sunday of Lent, we heard St Paul inviting us to proclaim with our lips, to confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And to believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead. We couldn't have more direct or simple, if you like, advice. Use your lips to proclaim Jesus is Lord. Use your heart to believe God has raised him from the dead. All these questions we often ask ourselves, how am I going to live Lent this year? What am I going to do? We have such simple statements that St Paul gives us. This Sunday, the second Sunday of Lent, we heard St Paul speaking about people who made earthly things the most important and their lives became kind of disorientated because of that. St Paul invited us to recenter and to refocus our lives with that truth. Our homeland is in heaven. We're invited to raise our hearts and minds heavenwards. Our homeland is in heaven. As we think about our Lenten journey, we think of the letters of St Paul. About a third, almost a third of the New Testament is taken up with letters written by St Paul. It's quite an astounding statistic that Almost a third of the New Testament, God's word to us, we find in letters written by St Paul, letters written to different communities. And it's good for us to remember that those communities that St Paul was writing to, the situations that he was addressing, it was a complicated and a difficult world. We live in a complicated and in a difficult word, world today. And it's good for us to remember St Paul was writing to people with difficulties. There were divisions within the communities. People had drifted away from their faith in different ways or people were struggling under persecution. There were all kinds of different situations there that St Paul was addressing as he wrote these wonderful letters. 
we're invited to listen to these letters which as the living word of God are addressed by God to us today written by St Paul but these things that God wants us to know that God wants us to respond to in our lives nothing more direct I don't think that those three phrases that we've already begun lent with, be reconciled to God. Jesus is Lord, proclaim that truth. Our homeland is in heaven. I'd like to begin, if I can move my screen, Matt, I don't know if you can help me out here. It seems to have the screen has struggling a wee bit there father there you go there there it is. Is. sorry <laughs> me and me and technology so i'd like to begin by going uh, back to the road to damascus we know famous story of saint paul traveling to damascus in order to persecute the early church he was persecuting christians he was filled with fire with a kind of power he thought that the right thing to do was to persecute the early church to persecute the early Christians. And then on that road to Damascus, have that moment depicted in this famous painting by Caravaggio, where he encounters the risen Lord, the glorified and risen Lord. He's depicted there as having fallen off his horse, not what we're told in the scriptures, but that dramatic moment. And he encounters the Lord and really, I've been kind of thinking about this moment that we read about in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter nine, and everything that St. Paul experiences there becomes part of what he manages to convey throughout the rest of his life in all his letters again and again. So firstly, that experience of the living and risen Lord, the one who had died for our salvation, who was risen, and St. Paul encounters him in his power have the statement made by Jesus when St Paul asked the question who are you Lord and Jesus responds I am Jesus and you are persecuting me this reality also that Jesus is living in his church you are persecuting me sometimes when we read the gospels and one of the differences I think between the gospels and the letters of St Paul both of which we need so much in the Gospels, we can kind of get a sense, well, yes, that was what it was like. It would have been good to have been there then, to have been with Jesus, but we weren't. The disciples of Jesus, the eyewitnesses, they were there, but we weren't there. That's the wrong way of thinking, and St Paul kind of corrects that for us by showing us in everything that he does, everything that he says, the power and the living presence of Jesus in the church. And this is the first moment where he has that experience, that experience of the living and risen Lord. What I find so wonderful as we read about the conversion of Saul, that moment on the road to Damascus, that dramatic moment, surely the most dramatic of any of the conversions in the whole history of the church, what I find so beautiful is how we move immediately from that moment of drama to a moment of wonderful simplicity. As you know, as a result of that vision, Saul is blinded and he needs to be led by the hand into Damascus. And the Lord appears to Ananias and tells him that he is to go and lay hands on Saul and baptize him. We're told that Ananias went and entered the house, the house where Saul was, and at once <clears throat> laid his hands on Saul. Brother Saul, I have been sent by the Lord Jesus so that you may recover your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was baptized there and then. This is a moment of real simplicity. And to me, it's absolutely crucial in our understanding of Saul and the faith of Saint Paul, this moment of simplicity, we think the risen Lord, the glorified Lord appearing to Saul, what need did he have of Ananias to be involved in this outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And yet this is the way that the Lord chose to work. This moment of simplicity, he chose to work through Ananias, 
through the laying on of hands on Saul, Saul receives his sight and he receives the Holy Spirit through receiving the baptism that Ananias gives him. Throughout Paul's writings, throughout his letters, the fact that the Lord chooses to work in this way is absolutely crucial and central, that he works through the sacraments, through the preaching of the church. This is how the Lord chooses to come with his saving power into the world. And all of this we can find at the conversion of Saul, not just that dramatic and personal moment, but Saul in humility needing to submit in a wonderful and a beautiful way to the laying on of hands that he receives from Ananias and the baptism that he receives from him. Here's a mosaic of the baptism of Saul. There's Ananias on the left-hand side, and it's written in the top left-hand corner in Latin, according to or by the command of Christ, Paul is baptised by Ananias. And as we look at this picture, we see complete change from Saul, who has been breathing fire, using his own power in persecuting the church, following his own ideas. And here, everything changes. He receives what God wants him to receive, and in the way that God wants him to receive it. There's kind of a beautiful and a simple and an inspiring humility in this. And this is what Paul again and again in his letters calls the church back to receive what God wants to give you in the way that God wants to give it to you. That's how Saul received his baptism from Ananias. Who would have thought that this is the way that God would choose to work? And yet he did. The simplicity of the sacraments of the church. One of the beautiful things that we can be inspired to think about during this season of Lent. God wants each one of us to receive those things that he wants to give us in the way that he wants to give them to us through the church, through the sacraments, through the preaching of the gospel. This sense of cooperation between human beings, between those chosen by the Lord and God's power to act and be present in his church with his saving power is there also at the moment in the, in the story, in the account of the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. Ananias has said, but this man, Saul, he's persecuting us. He has a warrant for our address, but the Lord for our arrest. But the Lord responds to Ananias by saying, this man is my chosen instrument to bring my name before pagans and pagan kings and before the people of Israel. The Lord speaks of Saul as his instrument. The word that he uses in Greek is the word for a vessel. And it's beautifully the same word that St. Paul will later use himself. This man is my chosen vessel or instrument. This is how God works. His power comes to us through vessels, through instruments. This is how the church works. And St. Paul will never forget that. In the second letter to the Corinthians, we read St. Paul saying, we are only earthenware jars or vessels, the same word the Lord had used, had used to describe Saul as his chosen instrument. We are only the earthenware vessels that hold this treasure to make it clear that such an overwhelming power comes from God and not from us. This is absolutely key to us understanding what St Paul is all about. This sense of, yes, this important task of holding this treasure, of conveying this treasure, of allowing God's treasure to become active and powerful in the church, that this power comes from God, St Paul says, and not from us. He is a vessel. And I think it's also an important and a useful way for us to understand the writings of St Paul. His writings as we listen to them at Mass, as we read them ourselves, we're invited to recognise these are God's chosen instruments. His treasure 
is there in the words written by St Paul. It's a beautiful way of thinking of the writings of St Paul, not just listening to words that were written 2,000 years ago. We are searching for and we're being offered God's treasure, this treasure that contains this overwhelming power that comes from God and not from us. There we see Ananias, if you like, acting himself as a vessel of God. He's giving this beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit to Paul as he baptizes him, gave the gift of healing to Paul as he laid his hands on him. Ananias as this vessel and Paul receiving as he himself will then pass on this beautiful treasure. Everywhere in St Paul's letters, we find this sense of receiving and of passing on. Just want to return briefly to a moment before the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. If you remember the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr, and this tells us also about this cooperation between the saving power of the Lord and those he has chosen. We have the martyrdom of Stephen, Stephen who is stoned. And we know that as Stephen is being stoned, inspired by the model of Christ himself, he turns to the Lord and says, do not hold this sin against them. Immediately after this moment, we're told that Saul entirely approved of this killing. I like the connection between this and the moment on the road to Damascus, because in a way, I think we can see the conversion of Saul, that appearance of the risen Lord to Saul as a response to the prayers of Stephen. Stephen, who has said, do not hold this sin against them, including Saul, but that itself has its origin in the cross, in the crucifixion, in the death of Christ, Jesus, who has said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The power of the cross of Christ is there in Stephen's martyrdom. And there, the effect of that, that prayer that this sin will not be held against them, is answered as the risen and glorified Lord appears to Saul and his conversion that follows on from that, his reception of baptism, his healing. We go back to the phrase that we heard um, at the beginning of Lent on Ash Wednesday. And when I put the first quotation up there, I didn't show the sentence that precedes it, where St Paul explains exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. It's as though God were appealing through us. And the appeal that we make in Christ's name is be reconciled to God. We beg you not to neglect the grace of God that you have received. So when Paul is begging the Corinthians, when he's saying to them, be reconciled to God. And this word of God that we hear at Mass on Ash Wednesday, be reconciled to God. St Paul has told us that he is speaking as an ambassador for Christ. God is appealing through him. This is the spirit in which we are invited to listen to all the words of St Paul. God is appealing through him. This treasure comes to us through him. If you like, we can see that exhortation, be reconciled to God as a treasure that we receive in our hearts. But do we receive it? Do we respond to it when we hear St Paul begging us? And it's God begging through St Paul, don't neglect the grace that you have received. This is a kind of interaction, if you like. We've been drawn into that communication with the Lord, the Lord who is present and active in his church. We're kind of led out of or protected, if you like, from that false sense that it's only those who were with the Lord in his public ministry, as we read about it in the Gospels, who can enter into a relationship with him. No, that living relationship is there through us, and it comes to us through the chosen vessels, if you like, through the sacraments of the church, through these letters that are written by St Paul, who was called and chosen for this purpose by the Lord. This sense of receiving and of passing on, of receiving something so precious, a treasure, 
we hear in, I think, the most wonderful way on Holy Thursday. When we arrive in Holy Week, Holy Thursday, this is how St. Paul begins his account of the Last Supper, those words that we hear every time we celebrate the Eucharist. But he get, begins by saying, this is what I received from the Lord and in turn passed on to you, that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and it continues as we know, but this is something received and passed on. This is how we enter into the mystery of the saving presence of the Lord, something received from the Lord and passed on. That's what the sacraments are, this treasure that's there for us, something received and passed on, this humility, just as St Paul freely and humbly, so different from his fire-breathing self as he went to persecute the, the church, freely and humbly received that baptism from Ananias within the church, received that healing. This sense of receiving and passing on is always there in a particularly apparent way in the sacraments. Why do we go to Mass? Why do we celebrate the Eucharist? Because it's been received from the Lord and passed on. That's the humble and simple and beautifully inspiring centre of everything that St Paul does. The only knowledge I claim to have, he says to the Corinthians, was about Jesus and only about him as the crucified Christ. St Paul is so weary of human cleverness, human ideas, fashionable thoughts, all of these kinds of things that complicate things and that lead us astray. Again and again, he brings us back to the simplicity of the message that he has received and passed on. The only knowledge I claim to have was about Jesus and only about him as the crucified Christ. Again and again, we hear St Paul talking about this, the power of the crucified Christ, the risen Lord whom he encountered on the road to Damascus was the one who had been crucified. And St Paul never separates the risen Lord from this. This fact is absolutely central and absolutely crucial. On Palm Sunday, we hear this wonderful hymn that we find in the letter to the Philippians that kind of expresses this and this union of Christ who gave his life for us and who rose from the dead for us. This is something that can never be the result of human thinking. It's received and it's passed on and we receive it in a particular way during Holy Week. But these are the words that I think we know so well, but this message received and passed on, this treasure, the power that we're invited to open our hearts to. His state was divine, yet Christ Jesus did not cling to his equality with God, but he emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave and become as men are. And being as all men are, he was humbler yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high and gave him the name which is above all other names, so that all beings in the heavens, on earth and in the underworld should bend the knee at the name of Jesus, and that every tongue should acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. The humility of Jesus connected to the humility, I think, that St Paul himself learned to live. But we have here the glorified and risen Lord. We should acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Exactly those words that we heard on the first Sunday of Lent. Use your mouths and your lips to profess Jesus Christ is Lord. That this Lord is the one who is humbler yet, even to accepting death on a cross. Here we have a painting of St Paul at the end of his life and as we look at him we see kind of all the tribulations, all the struggles, all the sufferings that he had clearly gone through throughout his life as he proclaimed the gospel. We maybe wonder why was it someone chosen specially by the Lord should suffer so many tribulations but in that he was able to profess the real power if you like the folly of the cross, the real power of the cross came through in his life precisely because of his tribulations and his sufferings in which he knew he was united 
in a wonderful way to the power of the, the resurrection of the Lord. And these words that all of us treasure and love so much, they were expressed with total sincerity and authenticity, precisely because of what Saul, Paul himself had gone through. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? None of those things, he goes on to say, can separate us from the love of Christ. And we see in that painting in the background, the sword, which is always there in paintings of St. Paul, that sword that's the symbol of Paul for maybe two reasons, but one of which I'll speak about just quickly just now. So here in the letter to the Romans, he says nothing, not even the sword, all of the things prior to that, he has already suffered and he suffered imprisonment and, and uh, being scourged and everything. But the final word that he says, or oh, the sword. And we know that the final moment of St. Paul's life will be when he's beheaded <clears throat> by a sword. But those words there are proclaimed for all of us to kind of connect to. No, none of that. All of that that seems so powerful, maybe the kind of power that Saul himself had tried to exercise as he was persecuting the early church. He's now on the receiving end of the sword, and yet paradoxically being on the receiving end of the sword, he's united to the greatest power. I think I'm going to skip this because we're kind of approaching the end and just maybe end with this picture um, of the baptism there of Saul, maybe inviting us in this week that lies, lies ahead. But if, as we think of the seasons of the church, as we move towards Holy Week, what is the celebration of Holy Week? What is the celebration of Easter? As we do those things, we're doing and receiving what God wants us to receive in the way that he wants to give these things to us. As we participate in the liturgies, as we participate in the Mass, as we participate during Lent in the Stations of the Cross and other devotions, but particularly as we move towards Holy Week and Easter, in that humility where you were united to the humility of Christ, the obedience of Christ on the cross, who then rises in glory. We're united to that power, just as Saul was from that very first moment and remained faithful to throughout his life. Let's ask the Lord maybe to help us to receive those things that he wants to give us in the way that he wants to give, it, give them to us in the liturgies, in the sacraments, and in a special way in the writings of St. Paul himself. These are the things that he wants to make known to us. He is appealing through the words of St. Paul. His is the treasure or the light that he wants us to receive into our lives. So next week, I think we'll be looking at the first letter to the Thessalonians. So Matt, I think I've more or less kept to Sister Anna Marie's very strict guidelines of 30 minutes and no more. <laughs> you did. Thanks so much, Father Andrew. And we've got more on in Lent, during Lent, which I'll share with you now. Tomorrow we've got stage, Pro-Life Stations of the Cross. That's each Tuesday in Lent at 7.45. You can register on our event right page. And this week it's a reflection from Father Paul Lee at St Agatha's in Methyl. We've also got on Saturday, what? Catholics in Health and Social Care, Ethics and covering that, uh, ethics and practice. Uh, so if you're interested in exploring the unique contribution that faith makes to the health and social care sector, you can register on the St Mary's website, that's stmary's.ac.uk. Finally, a testimony and reflection with Anton and Angela Colella is on Sunday, the 3rd of April at four o'clock. You can register on our event right page. That's one of several events that we've got on uh, in the lead up. Uh, it was part of the Amoris Letizia year. All, the, all that stuff is on our website, uh, archedinburgh.org, in the news section, and if you scroll down to the events, you should see it all there. Next week, we're back, as Father Andrew says, same time on YouTube, half past seven for another 30 minute event. Father, do you want to finish with prayer? Yeah, maybe we'll just all say together, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, and good night, everyone.